Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rent Prep for Landlords. You got Steve and I here as always, and we have two guests on the podcast today. And excited about this, I actually reached out to um, Kirk Duplessis, and he actually connected me in with his wife, who's also on the episode here today. Emily, how you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. We're excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Is this our is this our first husband wife uh, podcast team that we've done? No, no, we had Hampton and Hampton. Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay, yeah, they're property managers down in Florida. They're they're really great. Uh, so the reason that we reached out to you guys is you got a pretty interesting story. I actually landed on a blog post on the website optionalpha.com and started kind of crawling through a little bit and realizing that you guys are, you know, making money through investments and trading and then getting into rental properties and wanted to have you on the show. So before we get too far into it, I'll give you a little bit of background of their stories. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. And now your hosts, Stephen White and Eric Worrell. So Kirk and Emily Duplessis are real estate investors who primarily build their rental portfolio with buy and hold properties. So Kirk, the founder of Option Alpha, runs an options trading website. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. And that focuses on educating individuals on options trading and has built software to help uh, people make smarter trades. Sounds pretty high level stuff. I know Steve and I are confused. <laughs> it's so official. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has a finance background. And with that, Kirk brings a lot of insight into investing both in the options and real estate space. So Emily is a former teacher and is in charge of growing and managing the rental portfolio. She also runs a website called Rental Rookie. And this is where she focuses on teaching newbie investors how to get started with investing in rental property. So the the interesting thing, too, is that it seems like you both kind of uh, spur off on your own uh, strengths in that, Emily, you're a teacher who you're you're not a teacher anymore. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I um, left after we had our second child. So the rental income allowed me to have the option to leave. So that was, was awesome. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was the goal. goal so. Yeah. And then you're actually still using that teaching experience, though, to teach people about what's going on and what's been working for you guys. She can't stop. I can't. Yeah, I love teaching. So <laughs> that's how I still get my fix. So Kirk, can you can you start from the beginning? Tell us a little bit about Option Alpha, what you've been doing with that and how that ended up funding your real estate ventures. Yeah, I mean, I think we started um, you know, a while ago, but I started Option Alpha about 10 years ago. So my background was in MA in New York. I worked for Deutsche Bank, also did uh trading for Deutsche Bank, went to DC, um, worked in capital markets as a read analyst. So I would publish all those research reports that people see about like buy, sell, recommendations, et cetera. But that's where I got like I guess an initial preview to real estate because I was covering REITs and I would get to go meet with all of these, you know, big time CFOs and CEOs about how they would run their REIT business. And they would run it with basically like five or six people, you know, so you have these million dollar, multi-million dollar companies with five or six people running it. And I'm like, how in the world do they do that? You know, and actually we were just talking about it today about like doing some more things with REITs. Um, but yeah, so I've just always had a knack for finance and trading and, and started doing that. And then option alpha just, kind of spurred out of necessity. I started trading online by myself and uh, writing about what I was doing and journaling and people started asking questions. And I frankly got sick of replying to the same email 52 <laughs> times. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do a video and show you. And then, you know, that led to another thing and another thing. And so now we're a pretty big company. Now we've got 80,000 members across every continent, which is cool. And um, yeah, started building out some software to help people out. Very cool. So what what like point of building this business up were you thinking that maybe you want to get into real estate? Like how did that transition start to come about? Yeah, I think, you know, like I don't know, just naturally, like my family's always been in real estate. Like I always like joke to people, like our family vacations were to open houses. And people think that's like well, that's a lie. <laughs> like that's not a lie. Like that's what we used to do. We would travel on vacation and then just like we'd go to open houses because that's what my parents did because they were in mortgages. And so I, I've always known that I wanted to be in real estate. And so I knew I didn't want to do it until, you know, we got married and and once we, you know, kind of had our feet set. But I also knew that, you know, I wanted something that was different than trading, right? Like trading, you still have to go, at least at this point, you still have to go basically to work every day. You have to log in and make the trades and do everything. I wanted some other stream of income that, you know, was doing it for me basically. And I knew it would take, you know, I mean, it's not like totally hands off, right? Because right. you have to manage people, but we wanted to start slowly diversifying. So what we would do is we would take like a certain amount of profits that we would generate from the year and we'd buy a property. And now we're at the point now where each property is self-funding the next property, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this like snowball technique where we're not truly adding any capital to the business, but it's just allowing us to, you know, buy and buy and grow at faster paces, which 
ultimately is what REITs did. Like when I would study how REITs develop their business, they would basically, you know, leverage to a certain point, but then they would invest cash and they would take whatever cash flow that came off of all of these properties would allow them to buy and buy at a quicker duration. So they would buy, you know, six months, then they would, could buy at three months, then, you know, one and a half. I mean, just faster and faster and faster. Well, that's really interesting. I actually uh, just finished a book called The Four. Uh, this guy wrote it, Scott Galloway, and he talks about some of the major companies out there and how Amazon is just a beast. And he's like, one of the best things that Amazon does is they their taxable income is so low, they just buy up new stuff constantly. They're always reinvesting their income into new properties. And that's why you see them getting into like cloud services where they make a lot of their money. And it's interesting because you're doing the same thing where you're just constantly reinvesting though. So you're not just like sitting idle with anything. Totally. Yeah. We haven't really like, we've never taken income from it per se right mm -hmm. now. Cause like we have enough income from what we do, but that's like the beauty of it is like the first properties helped fund the second and the mm -hmm. second helped fund the third and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so at what point did the rental rookie spur, like, was it something as soon as you bought that first property, you're like, let's do this no. or <laughs> no, we bought our first property back in 2012. And so, and that was when we were green. I mean, Kirk knew a lot more than I did. I was an English teacher who hated numbers. So no, this like... was, and this is good because <laughs> she didn't even know what an ROI was. And I was I like it. arguing with her and I was like, honey, this is a great ROI. And she's like, I really don't care. She's like, I just want to make 500 bucks. I'm like, that's not the point. Like, it's a great ROI. And I, I had to explain what it was. Roy yeah, is such so a I, nice guy. I love I, Roy. Yeah. I, I was totally green in it. I didn't really understand anything at all. Um, so that was 2012. And then I actually started Rental Rookie, I think, in like the winter, springtime of 2014. And it was just out of, I realized that I went from knowing nothing to now, you know, starting into this and feeling confident and being able to grow the portfolio. And I just felt like there were a lot of people out there who were probably like me. And so I just wanted to start helping people and showing them that, you know, you didn't have to have a real estate background. You didn't have to be a finance guy. Like if you just put in a little bit of time and effort and learning, anyone can do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now I'm curious. So like when you were getting into this, were you guys kind of leaning on each other or were Emily, were you kind of spearheading it as you're uh, managing these properties? Cause like, I know personally when I got into being a landlord, I was 23 and I made every mistake in the book that you could possibly make. <laughs> so I'm just, guess I'm kind of just like asking, like, did you have any like big mistakes you made and that you've learned from as you're getting through this or? Oh my God. I mean, I think we still like, if you're not still making mistakes, I don't think you're like growing yeah. I guess, at a quick enough clip. Right. But, um, I think initially you probably lean on me. Yes. You know, I lean on you it, a lot but, in the beginning, but now like I lean on her, you know, because she spearheads everything now and, and she just kind of brings me deals and she's like, Hey, uh, this is under contract, you know, <laughs> get, get, get <laughs> hey, the we need to go see this. Yeah, get hey. the mortgage taken care of, yeah. or we need to go see this. But yeah, I mean, I think that we have obviously learned the do's and don'ts of landlording, even though you hear it a million times, you know, like you hear yeah. somebody say, oh, you got to do tenant screening this way. Or you got to do background checks this way. And, you know, I think it's so easy initially just to get caught up in getting a property rented and, you know, mm -hmm. not going through a walk-in checklist or a move out checklist. But I think now we've gotten much better at that, mm -hmm. although we could probably still improve on some right. areas. So. So I'm also curious, uh, being a husband wife combo that's working on this, do you ever <laughs> run into issues with that? Or do you guys just such a well-oiled machine at this point? Oh, that never, never, <laughs> never, no. I think over, yeah, overall we're pretty good. We definitely have, I think our moments of, um, like we kind of have defined roles in what yeah. we do and in the whole process of like, I'm kind of in charge of like finding and running the numbers. And then when I think it meets our goals, I'll come to him and say, Hey, I found this. What do you think? We'll go see it. He usually takes the lending aspect if we're if we are going to use a loan because right. he used to be a lender. So he's you know, he gets all that and it's easy for him to talk shop with lenders. Mm. And then I kind of pick it up after that with managing. So we kind of have defined roles in the process. And I think that helps. Yeah. And even like when it comes to like bookkeeping, like I collect all the bills, I pay all the bills, check everything. And then she manages like the accounting of everything. So like running our numbers and seeing where we're at every month. And, and I don't know like if other people do this, but for us, it's really good to have that defined split, like who's mm -hmm. doing what, um, because I don't like to look at properties and you've always liked to look at properties. Mm -hmm. You know, I just would rather come in later stages. Yeah. So. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that is super important. It's funny. I had a, a mentor of mine from years ago and uh, he had hired his wife and it worked out for like maybe three or four months. And I remember him telling me like, what we <laughs> say. Fastest way to a divorce, Steve, hire your wife, work with your wife. He was like, so <laughs> just over it. And, but we've seen a lot of, we've seen a lot of husband, wife teams that really work. And I think the key is a, you have to have the personalities where you can work together. And B, I think like we, what you guys are saying is 
you have to have defined roles and knowing what each other are, you know, what, what each other's doing and then be, be good at it. Right. You guys seem to each have found your own thing that you're really just naturally good at, um, or at least putting the effort into, uh, to do well. And I think that yeah. that's a huge part of it. No. And I think, you know, for us, it's really, you know, like what, one of our goals this year is to kind of not so much outsource per se, but either hire out or, or do something to, you know, facilitate lead gen because we just, you know, like she's pregnant for our third. So we got another kid coming and, <laughs> you know, like we just probably won't Thanks. have enough time to do a lot of lead gen that we want to do. So we've both recognized like, Hey, that's not something that we want to do necessarily, but something that's necessary. So, you know, maybe outsource that or hire somebody to do it. So, but yeah, I think having those defined roles is so critical because what we used to do is like something would slip through the cracks and we'd be like, Hey, did you call the tenant? And they're like, no, I thought you were going to call the tenant. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> called the tenant. And yeah. you know, and yeah. then it just, it slips. So, yeah. yeah. So I actually sent you a few questions here before we uh, got on the podcast and we're trying out something new here. And uh, I, I'll just be honest. I'm just completely ripping this from Tim Ferriss's book, uh, Tribe of Mentors. <laughs> I might have changed like two words he in these questions. Stuff from everybody yeah. else. So that's you know, well, if you're well, going to rip from someone, rip yeah, from yeah, yeah. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, there's things that work out there. So I'm going to open this up and either of you can answer this if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for three quick questions. So the first question I'm going to ask you here is what is the book or books you've given out most as a gift and why, or what are the one to three books that have greatly influenced your life? Do you want me to go first? You can go first. Okay. So I think there's two, right? So I think there's two, both books I've read twice now. So the first is the one thing by Gary Keller, which I think is, is a must read for anybody. Cause just, it's so has so much to do about focus. And like, this is something I struggle with for sure. Like even just yesterday was, you know, we get so torn into 10,000 different directions, it's hard to focus on truly the most important tasks. But like we were talking kind of offline earlier, like that's, that's where the growth is. Like you get the most important things done and you see all the growth. And then the second one, which I really like is Snowball, which is the, I don't know, if, I doubt he wrote, but it's an autobiography on Warren Buffett and his life. And it's a massive book. Most of it is useless in the sense of like, you don't really like, you know, it's just <laughs> truly his life story. Like every time he went to the bathroom, it's probably in there. I mean, it's just <laughs> so long but what you learn in that book for me is just like the relentless aspect that he had i mean like here's a guy who's arguably one of the biggest investors you know and best investors of all time also hop happens to be an options trader which most people don't know um but just was relentless i mean like had multiple failures never gave up you know was constantly you know good positive like always upward looking and and really kind of snowballed his life and like building more and more and more investments and then so I know I think about that a lot with our assets is, you know, how can we take what we have now and reinvest that and not, you know, spend it per se, per se but reinvest it for later. So very cool. So, yeah. uh, Emily, w what are the two books or three books that you might recommend? Um, one of them is more just a business mindset book. I would say it's called The E Myth. I don't know if you yeah. guys have ever read it, but um, yeah, Michael Gerber, I think. Yeah, so. I think that's yeah. who read it. But that was one of the first books I read back when we were getting started into investing and business and all of that with no business background. Um, and I just thought it was a great book because it it talked a lot about the idea of like you trying to have wear every hat in your business and what you're doing and how ultimately that doesn't really get you anywhere. And if anything, it might hurt your business and how you really have to find the areas where you are the most successful or the areas that I guess suit your talents the best and focus on those and find other ways or other people to be, you know, picking up the slack on the stuff maybe you don't like or you're not good at. And I think that was really big in us defining our roles with our investing. After reading that was like, we both then tried to pick areas that we were naturally good at and that we enjoyed and that helped us define our roles. So that was probably the one that I would say was is yeah. big that I like to share. You know, and I think the thing is too, is like, I don't know, you guys probably see this too, but people go into real estate, like it's a hobby and it's not really a hobby. I mean, like it's a business and I don't think enough people go into it like a business. Yeah. I often tell people, even in trading, it's like, you can't just open a restaurant and be like, I think I'll be there this week. And then, you know, like maybe I'll buy some food for people and cook it, you know, like it's a business and that's how you should treat it. And I think that book is probably a good one too. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, helps you treat things like a business. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, if somebody's listening and they've thought about maybe having a property manager take over, like, because yep. that's an issue that I see come up a lot in our Facebook group is there certain people that it's like, maybe you shouldn't be managing properties. Because if you, if you're somebody who has strength of yours, isn't telling people rules and <laughs> enforcing them, like probably shouldn't yeah. be a property manager. Maybe you should read that book and consider, you know, outsourcing some of mm -hmm. this work. Totally. 
And that's yeah. not a bad thing. I mean, that's not saying you're a bad person. Right. It's just recognizing your strengths, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and could you do way better and, you know, sleep better at night knowing you don't have to be the rule enforcer and following up with people. And yeah. So I'm curious, uh, based on that book, so you've got uh, 15 rentals at this point. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Now, do you guys like outsource most of the work then? Or you got, you're not going in there swinging hammers or doing anything like that, right? <laughs> no. 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 Yeah. Luckily, um, I mean, we manage the property. So we're dealing with the screening and getting the showings and getting tenants in there and those sorts of things. But um, when it comes to any kind of like major rehab work anything. or anything like that, yeah, we yeah. have a team that goes in and, and takes care of that stuff. We and did we, it. We did it originally. We did. We yeah. did it originally. And I'm glad we did because we learned mm-hmm. a lot in the beginning whenever we were the ones, you know, driving 40 minutes out to our first property to fix something small that they yeah. probably could have done. Um, yeah. So I think we learned a lot in that process, but now we're to the point that we can't, we just don't have the time to do it. So we have people in place that well, and my, my thing is like a scale thing, right? So like I get back to like my read days since like, you know, like if there's 11 guys running a multi-million dollar company, they're not swinging hammers, right? So like right. you have to build that into your numbers. You have to assume that you're going to have things go wrong and build that into your projections. And then when it happens, don't freak out. Like if a water heater blows, a water heater blows. Like it's mm-hmm. part of the process and hire the right guy to do it. So, yeah. Right. So which one of you are taking the phone call when a tenant calls and says uh oh that's definitely right. she's not taking the phone calls <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, i can't pay my can. rent this but, month but or whatever the case defense, is right but in her defense because we do have like we try to write you know some like verbiage into our thing to make sure that they don't call for a light bulb anymore yeah but um but i'll take the phone call and kind of like talk through it see what the issue is but then she'll usually schedule yeah. you know, the contractor right yeah i'll never forget my uh the, the breaking point for my father growing up and watching him, uh, you know, with his rentals, we had this one woman who was just brutal with every single maintenance thing that you can imagine. And the one day she had said that the, uh, the freezer was leaking all over the floor. And this was his breaking point of getting a property management company. We go there and it was her purse that was like hanging down so that the freezer door couldn't shut all the way. It was a purse strap (laughs) that was like in the door. And he was just like, I've had it. This is it. You know what I mean? Like everyone has that. We're close to that point. We had we had a in a, one of our college rentals because yeah. we have some student uh, rentals. Yeah. We had one, and that's like two blocks away or three blocks yeah. away from where we live. So I ran over there, and they said that the bathtub like wouldn't drain, and they just like hadn't on like you know they hadn't moved the drain thing up so that oh, it, yeah, yeah. it actually <laughs> broke down. And like her shock on her face when I was like, "Hey, watch this. This is crazy. Like you just." have to do this and she's like oh oh so you just like undo the drain well you, i don't know if it's legal to ask if you're a functioning human being on the rental application or not yeah. you know there should be a question like that I'd be like do you know the basics There's- of bathrooms yeah. <laughs> it's a generational thing you should you should just see my 12 year old son the first time he saw a hand crank window in a car like he's so used to buttons he like looked and he's oh, like yeah. what is that <laughs> he had That's no true. concept of how it worked so yeah, as a you know, there's a learning curve to life for sure. There so is. yeah, and definitely student with rent- student rentals. That yeah, is I was just gonna sure. say student <laughs> rentals. You probably get a lot of that for it's sure. So funny, but you gotta laugh about that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious with your student rentals. Um, are you guys requiring a uh, a personal guarantor like the parents to guarantee mm-hmm. the the rent? Yeah, yeah, yeah we have all of our ones have uh, a parent guarantee backed on on all of them. So. Um, and they all pay some sem- upfront in the semester. So we usually never get an issue. And if they have financial aid, we get the financial aid award letter. So, I mean, actually we're under contract to buy another one. And like, I think like next Friday, we're going to close on another mm-hmm. one, which is like a killer deal. And we've been trying to buy for like a year and, um, and, but yeah, I think it's, I think they're great. I just don't have too many of them, right. Like yeah. until we get other things. So, you know, that's the struggle. They're nice to have. They um they definitely make a decent amount of money. I mean, versus just a regular rental. So it's yeah. nice to have them in the portfolio. But I w- I wouldn't say we would ever want like an entire portfolio of student sure. rentals. Yeah, true. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, moving on to our next question here. This one is: What is the one purchase of a hundred dollars or less that has greatly helped you as a landlord, property manager, or investor? I guess for you guys, it'd be a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think for me, so like. I don't, I don't know if they have a paid version or if I just got it, but it, it's this ScanBot app, which I don't know oh, if you guys yeah. have ever talked about before. Mm-hmm. It is the most like wicked thing. Like the ScanBot <laughs> app is awesome, but it scans, like you can scan multiple documents in a PDF and it like changes all the colors and like makes them look like real documents, super easy. And then we just mm-hmm. upload it to Google Drive. So, you know, with 15 properties now coming in, like I just have a set day per week where I like scan all of our stuff and pay our bills. 
But now that we're like totally digital, it makes it so much easier when we go to get financing because then the bank wants to know everything about every property. I just send them like one Google Drive link and I'm like, go crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take yeah, take nice. what you want. So for me, that's like been a godsend because we used to have folders yeah. and then our stack of folders got too big that got lost <laughs> in our stack of folders. And so we had to go digital with everything. So yeah, that's a good one. Mile IQ is another great one where mile it can IQ track your mileage. Great. I don't know if yeah. you guys have oh, used yeah. that about it, but that's another great yeah, one that true. we really like. True, true, true. And does that and one? What's it, the other one? It's called Scan. Sorry, Eric. It's called Scanbot. Scanbot. And so, so you get a you get a bill in for a water bill, whatever it is that comes paper. You're scanning everything. that and then attaching that to each property. Totally. And it does it automatically. You don't have to like adjust it. It's, it's very slick. You can do multiple pages and then, and then it auto uploads right to your, you know, Google drive or Dropbox or whatever. So yeah, it's great. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. And I haven't used the mile IQ one, but I've heard about it. Is that, do you have to actually physically start that or is it just know when you're in the car and it just kind of tracks when you're driving or how's that work? It's actually gotten better because it auto tracks like certain trips now. So like what it used to do was like every time you go to the grocery store, you'd have to tag it as like a personal trip versus if you own the grocery store and then I guess that was a business trip. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but now it knows where you go in the car and it's, so it automatically tracks and, uh, and their newest, I think their newest update from like December was that it auto classifies. So like if we, if I drive over to our rental property to, you know, do something, it knows that I've been there and it auto classifies that quick drive, even though if it's five minutes, you know, that's whatever, five bucks are like right off. So yeah, I love it. Pays for Mm -hmm. itself for sure. Definitely. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's, uh, I've heard of it as well. And, uh, Oh my God, if you guys are not using it, I think like last year was like $4,000 of write-off that we had from just like driving, Wow. you know, like, and it, you just don't even know, but like we right. have property in Virginia. So if we would drive down to Virginia to visit family, we'd stop by the property and sure. like check the box. And, like, right, the right. 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 Yeah, Very cool. That's, uh, yeah, that is really cool. I'm not surprised that you guys are both, uh, you know, bring up apps or software or technology for your, uh, one thing under a hundred dollars just cause you seem real tech savvy. So, <laughs> Uh, last question I got here is how has a failure or a parent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Go ahead. Ay, ay, ay. I feel like it's actually kind of a more recent failure. Yeah, I, you, well, you had mentioned earlier about how you'll learn and everyone says like, don't do this, the do's and don'ts of being a landlord. Uh, I know what it is. Yeah. I know what it and, is too. but I, I, like Kirk mentioned earlier, I do think you kind of have to learn on your own. And we had a tenant who, um, was a single mom and was getting behind on rent and, you know, I was cutting her some slack and you went, totally I, know, slack. I know, I <laughs> know, totally but I just empathized with her a little bit too much. And so, you know, one thing led to another and before you know it, it was you know, four or five months later and she was pretty behind on rent and then she wanted to move out. And so now we're in this whole process of, I mean, she's actually been good and signed a guarantee about paying back everything she owes and has sent checks. So she has been good. yeah, she's been good. And so I think we, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get that back, but I definitely learned that, you, you know, you do have to be very business and professional and whether you empathize with them or not, you know, there's, this is a business and that's our money that they're not giving us. And so you have to follow the lease where whatever your days are with, you know, notices and evictions go through with that because even though it can be hard sometimes. Yeah. yeah. We've been through the eviction process, you Mm -hmm. know, like, and everyone thinks it's scary, but it was actually very easy. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, (laughs) kind of like, you know, if somebody wants to go on that path, it's like, uh, Hey, like, actually I love going through that process now. So if you want to, you know, if you want to dance, like we can dance. I knew too much of her story, I think. So that was it. You got too connected. So yeah. I was um, just going to say right now there's a thousand landlords listening, going, you'll never get that money. It's gone. Forget (laughs) it. You know, it's very, it's very rare, but it, it can happen. I mean, if she pays you yeah. back, that's awesome. Yeah, well, sure we got has. that first, the first check of her installment. I about yeah. fell over because I, yeah, I didn't think it was coming and you didn't think it was coming. Well, no, so. I mean, like we did this like, installment thing and I yeah. came home and I'm like, I'm like, we're not seeing a dime of this. And she said <laughs> yeah. like for five months and like the first month. And this was over the holidays too. Yeah. And I was like, okay, okay. we might actually we see might this. We might actually but, see it. Yeah, yeah. You write it off. So um, I think for me, I think what I look at now differently is capital expenditures, you know, the possibility of vacancy, like all of that stuff. I think we were blind initially in that we had such good deals that gave us enough margin, like enough cushion and cash flow to never really consider any of that stuff. But now as things get tighter and as we start to scale out more, and as we start to go towards, you know, multi, like bigger multi, you know, unit properties, 
that becomes really important. And like we walked through a property the other day and I told Emily, I was like, you know, I don't know if I would have bought this property again. And it's our most profitable property, but I foresee it as the property that's going to need a lot of work later on to sell, um, you know, just to get it like, you know, really show ready versus rental ready. So for me, it's just, you know, looking at properties a little bit different now, you know, but that's, I mean, that takes time. I mean, you can't learn that right away. So. Mm-hmm. Sure. Now you were mentioning like, so when you started out, were you in like single family homes and you're kind of building towards getting into like more multifamily and larger properties? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were in condos. We started with condos. We actually just sold this year or, or two. last year, our two, our two condos that we had, you know, for, mm-hmm. I think for mostly strategic reasons, but they also, you know, practically doubled in value in one case. So it's like, yeah. you know, you sell when you don't need to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, now we're starting to get into more multifamily. And, and like I told, actually, we were talking about this at lunch today with the girls is like, I would like to eventually get into more REIT stuff because I know that business very well. It's just getting to the point at which you can actually do that. And it's not, you know, every dollar that you have, right. It's, you know, just a portion of money. So, yeah. Well, Emily, tell me a little bit more about rental rookie. Uh, somebody's listening. I mean, I'm looking at, it, it seems like you got a ton of great resources on here. What's the uh, property analyzer? How's that tool work? For instance, that's definitely our most popular yeah. tool. I've re- that's like the one way that people, the one tool I get, you know, feedback on the most. And that's really a spreadsheet that we built for us. It's the spreadsheet that we use every Mm -hmm. week whenever, you know, we're analyzing deals. And, um, you know, it's a simple spreadsheet where you're just going in and plugging in, you know, purchase price. And um, if you're using financing, interest rates, terms, closing costs, taxes, insurance, all the stuff that, you know, you're pulling in number wise, and it calculates, you know, we've, formulated it so that it will automatically calculate your return on investment, your cash flow each month. And so it's, I mean, it's a simple spreadsheet, but it's the tool that we use all the time. And Mm -hmm. after I built it for us, I was like, well, I'm sure other people need it. So let's just put it out there for people to use. And it's definitely one of our most popular tools. Yeah, And we have a, like a pro version of it where I I think that, you know, like, especially newbies, because that's really what rental rookie is kind of tailored to is like people that were like Emily, you know, like Mm -hmm. a teacher or a coach that wants to get into it. And, um, but we have a pro version that I built out that's kind of like, and it's like on steroids from my days back in banking where I was like, you know, this spreadsheet only has one sheet. That's not even fair. Like, so the pro has like, you know, amortization tables and depreciation, sales forecasts and forecasts and everything, you know, tax, you know, write-offs and the whole deal for like 25 years. Right. So if somebody wants to get like super nitty gritty into the details, you know, then they can do that. But ultimately when you're just trying to make a decision, whether you should you know, waste more of your time looking at that property or not, like a quick run of numbers tells you everything, you know, like mm-hmm. if it's really worth doing or not. So yeah. You remind me of a buddy of mine who, who loves Excel so, so much. He swears he's, he dreams in Excel. <laughs> I do, like, yeah, yeah. He loves it. Yeah, 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 I do. I could tell, I could tell, I could see you just like, oh yeah, let me just like get my hands on this <laughs> macro here. This pivot yeah, table. So, I, I don't know if I'm using that all term, all right? Yep. All, all yeah. Buddy. So Emily, you also have a um, podcast and is that right that you're both actually co-hosts on that podcast, the rental rookie podcast? She allows me. Yeah. Yeah. She allows me to yeah. Do yeah. Well, that's definitely, um, we love doing that. It's yeah, it is fun. a lot of fun to be able to get on. And we just, honestly, it's a lot of sharing our stories and what we're learning. And rental rookie is all about like teaching what we're learning out in the field. So a lot of times I'll refer to us as like the crash test dummies of rental property. We're going out and we're trying things. We're trying new strategies. We just did a 1031 exchange. That was the first time we've done that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're going out and trying these things and just kind of reporting back to people what works, what doesn't work so that the learning curve is so much shorter for people who are just getting started and don't know where to start um, than it was for me, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I can tell just from this conversation too, because you were talking about the, uh, the one uh, tenant where you're, she's a single mom and your heart, mm-hmm. you know, and you're started pleading yeah. for her. Oh, and it's like, a, I can yeah. tell that you're not like really like just putting your best foot forward necessarily on your content. You're actually opening up the curtain and letting people see what's going on with what you have. And I, I think people love that. It's a, it's a way to follow somebody else, uh, see what's working for them and maybe, you know, skip a mistake or two that you would have made if you weren't, you know, following something like the rental rookie. So that's really cool. Yeah. Well, I think, I think our thing on that is, and, and my thing, even with option alpha is just to make it relatable. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like we're regular parents, like we've got two wild kids <laughs> that are, thank God, sleeping through this interview right now. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and we still have time to do all this stuff. And so, you know, people just get frustrated that they can't do it or they get overwhelmed, but it's hundred percent possible to do. And, mm-hmm. and that's what we're just trying to do is, you know, share what we're doing. Yeah. 
Very cool. So yeah, if you guys want to check that out, you can go to rentalrookie.com. And uh, there's also a uh, chance that you have a um, you have a Facebook group too that people can join yeah. and follow along too. And that's Absolutely. really great. I'm actually a member of that. It's a, it's a cool group. You got some good videos you put in there every once in a while too, I think. Yeah. 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 It's great. Uh, it's actually pretty active and you know, a lot of people are, it's fun to see people posting the properties that they're buying and yeah, asking great questions. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a great place for people to come and network. Yeah. I saw somebody had posted, um, their first property that they just purchased yeah, like just two weeks ago. Yeah, she did a selfie a right in front of the property. And I was like, man, that's yeah. an awesome post. Like that's awesome. Yeah, well, to see. I told Emma, I was like, if that doesn't it was like the fuel best. and you know, like the desire to keep doing more of that stuff, it's, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Yeah. Like that's, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Communities are awesome. Um, sometimes it's like babysitting, right? <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> it is. Where you're like, yeah. 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 Keeping yeah. people apart from each other and like, well, maybe you shouldn't talk to each other then. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, communities are an awesome place for people to go and, and crowdsource stuff. What's working for you? What's not? And, you yeah. know, it, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, we get a lot of ideas. I mean, we've gotten a couple little like little tweak ideas from the community where it's like, why did I not think about that? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And it's yeah. just like so obvious that it sometimes like hits you over the head. Yeah. But that's been and that, we're we're learning too. Which is yeah, cool. and that's been cool. So. so that's been good for us. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, can't thank you guys enough for being on the show. It's really interesting. Uh, you know what? It's uh, cool to see how well you guys, you got a yin yang going, you got the numbers guy, you got the person who's you know out there working on the properties and uh, bringing everything together. I just think you guys got a really cool flow to you, the way you work together. And uh, I don't know about you, Steve, but I'm like feeling inspired to go get some rental <laughs> properties or something because I feel like they're crushing it. And I'm just like, you know, Watching my Robin started, Hood hey, account. We started flipping. We're, yeah, we're doing our we're second flip. Testing so we'll this see, out to we'll see, see how happens, it goes. You know? we'll That's so cool. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. But no, we really appreciate you guys having us on and you know, getting to share our story and love what you guys do. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right. Take care, guys. Uh,